This is what the Bible says. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them amongst all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. God, we thank you again for your word this morning. We pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you cause us to understand what you're bringing to us today. And I pray that our hearts will be open to receive your word and to act upon it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week, we read the wonderful gospel that was preached with this man called Peter. And we also saw that this was not the, you know, the normal occurrence. The Peter, Peter the, the apostle as we know him, he wasn't this bold until when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were empowered as uh, Christ had promised them ahead of time that when you receive the Holy Spirit, He will empower you to be my witness. And now we see the first preaching by the apostle. There was a gathering, supposedly more than 5,000 people. Many people were gathered around to hear First of all, they were confused. Their confusion drew them to where the apostles were and the rest of the disciples. And they had this voice, they had these men and women speaking the language that is known to them, them praising God, speaking of the wonderful things God had done to them, and they wondered what it was. What this was, was new to them. It was new. And today, we want to talk about the real fruit of conversion. We see after the gospel was preached, there were a lot of questions that were asked. But we'll point out a few of them that are really important for us today. Maybe when we talk about conversion, what do we really mean? 
where there is conversion, there is a changing of something, of a form, from one form to another. Or if it's a person, there's a change of heart from what you believed before and a new thing that has dawned to you. And that would prompt our hearts to think afresh. And this is what John the Baptist said. Therefore bear fruit that are worthy of repentance. So where there is conversion, we realize that there is repentance. People have repented of their sins. And there is something else that is happening in their lives, as we will see here. And repentance comes when the true gospel of Jesus Christ is preached to us. And we had already mentioned a few of the aspects of this gospel. And I'll just mention them in passing so that we, it helps us to get what we're talking about today. We mention that this gospel, it is Holy Spirit empowered. It is not just what I think it says. It is not what I just think is written here. It is what is actually written. And the power that transforms people comes through the Holy Spirit. The gospel is Holy Spirit empowered. And also it is founded upon the Old Testament scriptures. We see this when Jesus Christ spent time teaching them. The Bible says he opened the, the scrolls from Moses and, and the, the prophets as he explained to them the scriptures. The gospel about the Messiah. It is about Jesus Christ. It is about Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. That is the central message of the gospel. If it's not centered around the death of Jesus, around the burial and the resurrection, then it is not the gospel. It is something else. It is also very logical. It is not just emotional feeling that we have today and tomorrow it's gone, we wonder, you know, where it disappeared. We have to approach it logically. Things have to be explained. That is why throughout the scriptures, even as we read last week, Peter was explaining to them what they actually did to Jesus. It was not just the Roman guards who took Jesus to the cross. It is our sins that drove Jesus to the cross. You have to think about it mentally and logically. It brings sins to conviction. It requires some things of the listener. After you have listened to the gospel, what is your response? Then there's forgiveness of sin when people heed to the gospel. The gospel is universal and eternal, and it includes exhortation to separate from the world. We are called out from the world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. So we are going to talk about a few aspects of this conversion as we see here in the scripture. The Bible says, now when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart. The number one aspect is the listener will be cut to heart after they have listened to the gospel. There's conviction of sin that leads to a change of heart. You see, when he was preaching this, the Bible told us that the people who gathered in Jerusalem, many of them were noble. These people were learned. They knew the scriptures. They knew the Torah, the fingertips. 
And when Peter is preaching to them and reminding them of the prophecies that were written by the prophet Joel and he quoted from Psalms and all these things brought together, the Bible says here, they were cut to the heart. Listen, friends, if the, the word of God does not pierce people into their heart, it either means whoever is presenting him the, 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 the word of God wasn't clear, or the people themselves are rebellious. They, de- they don't want to receive God's word. It's either of the two. Because this word has power to change and to transform people's life. This group of people, they came, they gathered around, Mocking the disciples, saying, "Ha! Look at them! They're drunk. They have new wine with them." Because they didn't want to accept the reality of what God is doing. It's a new dawn. God is pouring His Spirit upon all flesh. They say these these guys are drunk, and that gave the apostles the strength to stand up and to defend righteousness, to defend the cause of the gospel. After they had all these words spoken by the apostle, the Bible says they were cut to the heart and they said, to Peter and the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren, what shall we do? A great response right there. At any given moment, at any given time, when God's word is preached, the listener ought to respond by asking themselves questions. I have heard this word today. God, what do you want me to do? They ask, what are we supposed to do? What must we do? And this was not just, they weren't just suggesting like, hey, is there anything we can do right here after listening to you? After throwing all these words to us, is there anything you want us to do? This came heavy into their hearts. Many of them listened to the prophecy, but the prophet Joel, and these people witnessed this happening. They say, are these people Galileans? How is it possible that we hear them speak? In our own language. This is not the usual occurrence. Think of when Jesus was brought to the the religious leaders. And they wanted them crucified. They say crucify him. Crucify him. He's offending us. He's offending us. He wants to take our position. We want him dead and instead bring us Barabbas. That is what we want. This is probably the same tone that they are asking the apostles and others to. And saying, hey, what must we do? We have offended a holy God. What must we do? What must we do? If you've never asked yourself a question after a sermon, maybe think about it. Think about it. They say, what must we do? Then Peter said to them, repent. After all the things that Peter said to them, and they are asking questions, he knew that it was the right time to tell them 
these words. Imagine if they, after they come and they gather around and they're wondering what is happening, like, hey, what's up? What's up? What is happening here? And the apostle will be like, hey, every one of you repent. Do you think they would have repented? They, they, they repent of what they don't know. They live in sin, but they don't know. They haven't been prompted to know the type of sin they bear in their hearts. Taking the most holy one to the cross. They had the gospel preached. He probably explained this for hours, a few hours. And then when it was the right time, he said, what must we do? He said to them, repent. These are words that are not common in our pulpits today. For when you tell people to repent, they will see the door and they never show up again. So why, why are they telling us to repent? Who do they think they are? They think they're, they're holier than thou kind of people. Why are they saying? Why is he telling us to repent? I am not telling you to repent. I'm just reading the word of God. And if it drives you to repent, the better for you. If it drives me to repent, the better for me. What must we do? Say repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. The promise of the Holy Spirit is not just for us. You have witnessed it. But this promise belongs to you and you and you and even afar off to those that Jesus himself will call to himself. When people ask what to do, then tell them what to do. And what to do in this context is to repent and to turn away from our sin. To repent, if you repent, there will be forgiveness of sins and also there will be an outward proof of what happened in the inside and that is baptism. So just a reminder that baptism does not save you. You don't come and say, I want to be baptized so that I, I get born again. <laughs> that is not how it works. It is an outward sign of what has happened in the inside. But we know it, especially in this country, at least a few years back. If we wanted to apply for some, you know, whatever government things and trying to find our identification cards, do you know one of the requirements was a baptismal certificate. I'm trying to find an ID and at the government office that is one of the requirements. Baptismal card. Do you have it? So think about it. Did everyone get born again who are being baptized because they are looking for identification cards? I suppose not. And not just finding an ID and other places in the government, you're admitting children to schools and other things. They wanted a baptismal card. I don't know why. <laughs> I can't figure it out how they march together. I'm not very old. I am only 40 years age. That is not too much. But at least when I got born again, there was the fear of God in people's life. That things were not just done for the sake of doing. 
when, when we would meet our brothers and sisters in the Lord, we would share testimonies. The brother, the Lord has been so good to us. He's, he's done wonderful things to us. Though I didn't have food yesterday, but I'm here today by the grace of Jesus Christ. We barely hear people mentioning the word Jesus today. <laughs> it's a church thing. We only mention it in church and that's done. At least back then, there was a little respect for the church. Even the government, when you, you're trying to process documents, they want other church documents to tell them that we're not just admitting a crook over here. We're, we're admitting people who have senses, they can think, they can logically approach things. Things are happening in the village, at least they'll call a pastor to come and mediate. Things are happening in school, they'll call a pastor. What is happening today? People will walk straight in the church and curse the pastors. Do you know why many people, this time at least, are asking this question? Because God's word was cutting through, went straight through to their heart. And then when it goes through, you know what happens? There's a response that comes from me. What am I supposed to do after hearing this? It is not just hearing God's word like, that was a good word, man. God bless you. That was a good word. And we go back in our sins. We do the same things we do. There's no change of heart. You know what it means to repent? Is to turn around and go the opposite direction. That is why John said, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. So when people ask you of what they should do, tell them what they're supposed to do. And that is to repent. To repent. And they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is not just for the few. It is for everyone. Because God said, I will pour my Spirit upon all flesh. Upon everybody. People will prophesy and they will see dreams and visions. He continues to say, verses 40, And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. That's a good preacher right there. A good preacher will always warn the flock. He will always warn. Because people will oftentimes or deliberately live a certain lifestyle that does not please God. Say, so run away from this perverse generation. If you have a King James Version, it says a crooked generation. I looked that word in Greek. It is scolios, which means crookedness. So you say, you guys are crooked generation. <laughs> and this is where because we, we, we borrow a lot of things from the Greek language, especially the English connotation. In English, this is where the word scoliosis came from, which is a condition 
where the spine is not aligned properly. The doctors in the house know about that. It is a condition. <laughs> so you think about it. This is very unschooled person as we know him, the Apostle Peter, right? This is a fisherman that Jesus called from fishing and said, you become a fisher of men. And we'll see it happening. But then for him to have this medical connotation as he's speaking to people, he's telling you, uh, people that you guys' lives are broken. And in this condition, they say it has no cure. This condition has no cure. People who have this condition, they, they don't stand properly. Even if they're sitting, they, they try to use their arms to help their back straighten up when they sit down. It is painful. Right now, if you, you, you whatever happened, you fell down, falling down, and you break your spine, you won't be able to walk, right? You struggle. The, your, your hands will, will, will struggle to coordinate. Your speech, even everything about you will be scarred just because one part of you is messed up with. You know, sometimes we'll say, well, this is just a finger. If it's cut off, I can still leave. Try that with your spine and see how you, you like it. And it's amazing that he uses this connotation to address this group of people, over 5,000 people. He's telling them, you guys have a condition that the world cannot solve. Your problem the world cannot solve. You cannot solve it intellectually. You cannot solve it physically. But there's a call right here. He said, repent all of you and you will be forgiven of your sins. You have a way out at least in the spiritual aspect of it. You want to change or you want to continue living a crooked life. He didn't just preach the, the ones we read yesterday, those few verses. That's not all. The Bible says here, and with many other words, persuading the people, talking to the people with boldness, with courage. He told them, run, run away from this perverse world. Run away from this bent world. Run away from this crooked world. And the Bible said they were pierced into their hearts. Be saved. But those who say they are saved, you know, what are you saved from? What are you saved from? Maybe you say that I'm, I'm not a liar. I don't steal no more. What are you saved from? The second aspect we are going to see here is the change of priorities. After they were cut to the heart, then there are things they begin to
to prioritize. The Bible says, Then those who gladly receive his words were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. They gladly received God's word. That's a wonderful priority to make in life. To prioritize God's word above all else. Because they would verify, I think most of these people, because they had uh, read the Old Testament and they could verify the words of the apostle, they received it. They received it. As the Bible says, those who gladly received it were baptized. You see, after they received the word, that's when they were baptized. You guys think about it. This, at the end of today, we'll be baptizing people here. If we were to baptize all of you here, man, I'll go home tired. <laughs> we are not even a thousand. These people baptized 3,000 people. 3,000 people. What a joy to see the people who were scared, the people who went back fishing. Now they are Holy Ghost filled and they are baptizing people, and joy has filled their hearts for the Word of God has come. To pass and they see it. What a joy. Those who received it, they were baptized and they were added to the fold. This means as they are going back, because definitely many of these people, they came for um, the feast, the Passover feast, they are going to go back to their hometowns. You know what they are taking there? The gospel. They had the hope of seeing, or seeing the Messiah or seeing these days being fulfilled in their times. That we'll see the Messiah come and he will restore Israel. But then as they go home, speaking to the people they left, like, hey, do you know whom we met? We met the real Messiah. What a good news to take home. I went to this trip, I went to work, I went to do these things, but what I brought home was Christ. That was a joy, to bring Christ to their homeland, the places where they belonged. This is the question that probably we need to ask ourselves. If the apostle was addressing them, and he's alluding to a condition that has stifled them, the question is, how long has this condition affected us as the church? That we don't do things straight, everything is bent. We don't speak out straight. We don't, we, we don't come out clean. We always dodgy, 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 dodgy. We don't speak the truth. For how long have we been affected with this condition? Maybe for some it's the tongue, what we say, what we speak to people. We backbite, we say we. For some it's their hands, they just want to steal just a little, just a little. For some it's their feet where your feet is taking you, the places you're not supposed to go. 
I don't know what it is for you, but I suppose there's probably some one thing that you need to bring to the Lord. I know I have something that I need to bring to the Lord. Say, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus wants to give us rest. When people repent, when people turn around, then they change their priority. Their lifestyles don't remain the same again. That is why John says, bear fruits worthy of repentance. If you say you have repented, can we see it? Oh, the Lord just looked. He looks at the inside. You guys don't see it, right? The Lord knows it. The Lord knows my heart. He equally knows that my heart is wicked beyond explanations. <laughs> so if we have any form of righteousness within ourselves, the things we've made for ourselves, we're wrong. We need to pay attention to what he says to us. You know what he said there? We read it in chapter, or in verses 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. He's not saying, hey, you guys know whoever crucified Jesus? We're supposed to get those guys, pin them down, probably kill them. He's not talking about them. He's addressing these thousands of people. He's saying this Jesus whom you crucified, this same Jesus, he made him Lord. He's Lord over all. The question is, are you going to accept Jesus as your Lord overall? Or you just want to pick a few aspects of your lives and say, well, you can come in here. You can come in here. But this other part, you can come into my living room. You can come into my backyard. But you cannot come into my bedroom. You're not allowed. You cannot come into my secret place. You cannot come into this. And maybe you're not saying that, but the actions, the things we do, tells us for sure that we have not welcomed him to be Lord over all in our lives. If you still can live with your girlfriend and have no problem, there's a problem with that. Though we are destined to get married, we are getting married next month. So we can as well start to plan our lives around each other, you know. And we, we, we behave so spiritual, you know. You know, we want to plan our finances together. You know, we want to pay rent together. We want to we wanna get bills together, Mr. Spiritual. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to me. <laughs> I know it. You can't do that and say, well, I, I, I follow Jesus. If you have to follow Jesus, you've got to forsake things that he say you do. You have to repent of your sins and follow Jesus. Be straight. Live a straight life. You can hide things from us. You can hide from him. If we don't continue daily following after Christ, the enemy is continuing daily pursuing your life. If he gets a loophole, he will get in. Watch out.
The Bible says here, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayer. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now we see the aspects of a vital church that is now growing. And this aspect, I would ask you guys, there are the lobby. We have the pillars of the church written down for us. Go through them. Take a screenshot. Go read them. Some of those aspects are mentioned here. Number one that is mentioned here is continuing in the apostle doctrine. That is essentially continuing in God's word. And number two here is fellowship. And number three is breaking of bread, communion. And number four here is prayers. If these aspects are missing in our lives, then I don't know what kind of church we believe in. Do we believe in all these things? Do we believe in the appointed elders of the church? I would ask you to refer to those notes that are out there at the lobby. They continue steadfastly. If we don't continue steadfastly, the enemy is steadfastly looking after us. He will find those people who are not following after God. So number two was a change of priority. Why? Because they gladly received God's word. And number three, there is fear of God in true repentance. The Bible says here, 43... Then fear came upon every soul. In Proverbs, the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, they began to be wise as they paid attention to God's word. You begin to receive wisdom from God when you're paying attention to what He says. Not what I think He said, what He actually said. You know, most of the time we, we just want to paraphrase the Scripture and take it as the final authority. No, He didn't say, touch. Did God really say you shouldn't touch? Did God say you shouldn't even come close? Did God say that? Did God say? Did God? Anytime you hear that happening, you know that there's something that is going to go down that is not right. Did God say? Did God say? There is the fear of God in true repentance. When people repent, they begin to fear the Lord. Not to run away from the Lord, but to revere Him. There is reverence of the Lord in the things they do. And there is fruit of that as we continue to read. The Bible says the fear... Um, fear came upon every soul, and many wonders in sign were done through the apostles. Now all who believe were together and had all things in common and sold their possession and goods and divided them amongst all as anyone had need. So continually, daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. 
And the Lord added to the church daily to those who were being saved. In other words, there was fruit of their repentance because other people would see it and they joined the church. They became part of the church. Now, a few things to note here. That if an aspect or an idea is mentioned in the Scripture, especially throughout the Gospels, through the book of Acts, and other letters that are written, then you know that that is probably something that the church needs to adapt and follow and do. Like uh, continuing steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, this one we ought to do because it's repeated. Paying attention to God's word is repeated in all the gospel, in the book of Acts, and the letters that are written. But there are other aspects that did not continue after this. And that is the aspect, that is the idea that is brought in verses 45, and they sold their position and goods and divided them amongst all as anyone has need. Because many other people wants to say, because this was the beginning of the church and this is what they did, so every year the church, this is what we ought to do. What do you think? If you think we should do that, please go sell your vehicle right now. Bring it. Go sell your house. Go sell those things that you have. And bring them so that every one of us will be what? Equal. Equality, right? <laughs> that is not the idea that is carried through the scriptures. It is something that was helpful for this group of people this time that cannot be applied to the life we lead right now. We are commanded to serve the Lord with what we receive. If the Lord calls you to sell your possession and bless the church, that's good of you. And thank you for listening to God. But he didn't tell everybody here to do the same. So we got to pay attention to what God is saying we do. If it tells me to do something, I'll do it. But it doesn't mean that if it tells me to sell my car, I should come and tell the church, because of what God told me, and you want to be partakers of that blessing, every one of you, go sell it. That is not what we see. But the principle that we borrow from here is that there was a change in relationship. They became one body, and Christ's love overshadowed them. They did this because of this kind of love that overshadowed them. Trust me, you can love people without selling your car. You can love people without selling your land. You can love people without selling all the possession you have and still belong to the body of Christ. Amen? They praised God and they had favor with the people around them. They had favor. They spoke the gospel and we see here that the church was growing day after day. They could not contain what they received. They didn't have the strength to suppress it, but they spoke of what God did. As I bring the worship tip to come. Maybe it's a point for us just to think, you know, has God ever called me to serve Him with what I got? I believe He did, and He does in various aspects, to serve him with my time, to serve him 
you know, blessing other people, especially what God has called us to do as a church, to bless the children. This coming week, the, the next week, we'll be going to do some outreaches, especially to where kids are, to share the gospel with children, to let them know of the love of Christ. I mean, think about it. If we just sit here and we don't share the gospel with people out there, especially children, the world is busy installing into their little brains things that aren't godly. You guys have heard of this pronoun problem that the world is struggling with? I, I am I identifying as them. Call me them from today. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. The world is not. That is what the apostle is saying. Hey, the world is crooked. Be saved from the perverse generation. The world is bent. They can't think straight. Why do we want to follow what they say? Are we going to stand up for the real gospel of Jesus Christ and say we are going to follow that? We are, we are going to do what the Bible says, no more, no less. This is my Bible. I'm going to do what it says exactly. There's pressure from your boss. There's pressure from your government. There's pressure from this employer. If you don't, recognize them the way they want you to, then you're not employed. I'd rather sit without that employment. But you know what people will do? Like, man, we're looking for livelihood. So we'll do whatever it takes, whatever it takes, to compromise of the gospel. If the apostle Peter compromise the gospel, people would have now received Jesus Christ in great numbers that day. Why do we think we have the liberty to do that which they didn't do? Water it down just a little bit. Do not offend people. If the gospel will not offend you, I don't know what else will. It offends my will every day. That is the way or how I can even think of, you know, running away from this. Because my flesh wants to do this. Christ tells me, no, I'm offended. My flesh wants to go this place, to do this thing, to indulge in this. Christ say, hey, you do that, it will be harmful. It will hurt you. And they're like, no, I, I want to do it anyways. The gospel is offensive. It is. But I don't know where this finds you. They say, what shall we do? Say, repent. And you'll be forgiven. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Maybe all of you are born again. Maybe not. Maybe there's something you need to bring before the Lord. Bring it to the table. Whatever struggle that may be. The Lord, who is gracious, knows about it. I mean, we, we can't continue living in our sins and expecting God to move in our lives. We can't continue living in sin and expect God to move in our church. We can't continue living in sin and expect the world 
to honor Christ in our lives. Doesn't happen that way. Repentance means a change of mind totally from what you believed to what Christ is telling you right now. I don't know how he speaks to you. Maybe he's speaking right now to some of us through his word. I don't know. But I know he speaks to us. I only pray that we will pay attention to him when he speaks. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for always and always revealing yourself to us, revealing your word to us. And we pray even today that you will help us through the word that we have read today that we will learn to pay attention to you. And if be there anything in our lives that is crooked, everything that is not aligned, how I pray the Lord you will help us to align it. Help us to come clean. For you know us. Even before you, we utter a word, you know it. Please help us, God. Those who need repentance, I pray that you forgive them. Those who need courage, I pray that you give them courage. Those who need strength from you, I pray that you give to them. Those who need your joy and your peace, I pray that you provide it for them. For you are a generous God. Thank you, God. And as we serve you this morning with our finances, I pray that we'll give that which brings glory to you, that which brings honor to you. You have blessed us abundantly, and this is a response for us to say, God, thank you for blessing us this much. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.